So week three of Daniel, and uh, we are going to jump back into Daniel 2. Daniel 2 is where King Nebuchadnezzar has this dream, okay? And he is uh, uh, troubled by the dream, and so he goes to those who are the, the magicians in his court, and he says to them, hey, not only do I want you to interpret this dream, but I want you to tell me what the dream is. Right? And so this is a problem for them because to this point, they could hear what was being said and then just kind of feel their way around and say some things that seemed to make sense. I think this is kind of human nature, right? I was thinking about this as application in our lives, right? So when we hear something, when we hear uh, something being communicated, we, we tend to kind of look at it and then try to do our best to kind of translate it. And King Nebuchadnezzar is concerned. So this dream is so terrifying that what his concern is that, that he's going to just tell them what the dream is and they're not going to be able to tell him the truth about it. And he needs to know the truth. And so I've titled today's message, uh, What's Coming Next, Part 1. And uh, the reason for that is this is a lot of information. And the last couple of weeks, I've tried to cram it all each session in in, into this one, into the individual messages, and they've been extremely long, and I'm really going to try for today not to be long. But on midweek coming up, I will be, uh, uh, just want to point out, guys, my clicker is not working, that uh, this week on midweek, I will be jumping into part two of this. And so if you haven't been tuning in on Wednesdays at seven o'clock and you want to get the rest of this, uh, be sure to do that online. That's the only place that we're doing that is online. Uh, and so you can jump in online uh, for part two. So uh, what's coming next, part one. So uh, word gets back to Daniel and it's time for a prayer meeting, right? Uh, because what the king says is, if you cannot come and tell me what the dream is, if you cannot interpret the dream, then I'm going to have you killed and have your homes burned to the ground. In fact, he says, I'm going to have your bodies ripped apart. So pretty violent man. And he does this thing where he uses this imagery that is violent and terrifying. And he says, you'll need to come up with what the dream was and the interpretation. And Daniel says, Guys, if we don't want to die, we need to hear from God, and so it is time to pray. And so him and his friends, uh, who many of you know as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, those four get together, and they begin to pray, and they hear from God, and they come. Uh, Daniel comes, and uh, he comes, and he presents to uh, King Nebuchadnezzar exactly what was in the dream. And in Daniel 2, verse 27, he answers the king and said, No wise men, enchanters, magicians, or astrologers can show to the king the mystery that the king has asked. And so he comes in, and, bef and instead of just coming in and, and being like, yeah, hey, I've got the answer because I've got the direct line, I've got the connection, he comes in and he says, there, there isn't anyone that can do the thing that you're asking, but there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries, and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. This is important for you in your life to understand that it is in moments like this where we just give the glory that's due God to him that we are planting the seed in other people's lives at how incredible and awesome God is. And if God is doing something in our lives and we come in and kind of save the day and we don't turn the direction of praise back to God, right, then we do not take the opportunity to plant that seed. Now, this is a huge because ultimately we will see Nebuchadnezzar uh, declare God as being the only God and his God in the end. In fact, I'll argue that Nebuchadnezzar gets saved at the end of his life. And why is that? It is because Daniel, is there in his life constantly planting the seed and pushing Nebuchadnezzar along to that point of salvation. So, but this language, there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. My question for you is, do you believe this? Do you believe that there is a God in heaven that reveals mysteries? 
And you might say to yourself right now, well, Pastor Jim, that's kind of a dumb question. I'm at church on this Sunday. Of course, I believe that God reveals uh, the mysteries to us, right? Now, the reason I ask this question is that though it might seem rhetorical, not all who call themselves Christians believe that God is actively at work revealing him, himself, revealing his nature to his children. In fact, there are those who would call themselves Christians that uh, would even look at the Word of God as being more metaphorical or uh, some type of nuanced gathering of ideas and not the actual Word of God. And I can't make that decision for you, right? I'm going to go ahead and tell you that I believe that it is the Word of God. It is for us and it is by Him and we can take it to the bank. It is exactly as God says that it is, and that there is a God who will reveal to us, if we long for it, if we ask for it, the mysteries of those things that we are asking about. And so, Daniel says, now that we have established where the answers come from, I will now tell you what you saw. And so he goes into the dream and he tells him about this statue that he had seen in his dream. And so this here beside us is an image of uh, that statue, just an artist rendering. And so that statue had a head of gold. And uh, so I want to help us with our timeline that we've been working on uh, over the course of this series. And so he comes in and he says that there is a, uh, a head of gold and then there are, uh, there's a, uh, uh, I got that wrong. It is actually the uh, middle of silver uh, and the arms on here are important uh, on this middle body uh, and then uh, those are just out of order arms of silver and then there was the middle of bronze and then there is a fourth section and that section has this it, it's really two sections connected and it is legs of iron and ten toes on the feet that are made up of iron and clay. And, and, and all of this detail is important uh, for us in looking at how we're going to understand this dream, okay? Now, I want you just to kind of think about the dreams that you've had in your life, right? Uh, uh, I, I don't know if, if, if you dream regularly. I dream all the time. It is a, just a nightly part of, uh, of who I am, and I remember my dreams. Uh, not everybody does. Uh, you know, for the longest time, I thought everybody dreamed every night, and everybody remembered their dreams. Uh, that's not the way that we're all wired. I dream dreams all the time, and I'll wake up, and I will have dreamed an entire movie, and I'll tell Carmen about it, and, you know, she, sometimes she says, that was amazing. Sometimes she says, I'm glad I'm not in your head, you know, uh, uh, some of the things that will populate inside of there. I'm not really sure, based on the way that Daniel presents this, what was so terrifying to Nebuchadnezzar. I mean, just think about that, and if you want, you can go back and look at Daniel 2. I don't have time, but something about this dream was terrifying, and perhaps it's the end of it when it gets to the stone, and the stone comes and smashes this statue, right? Uh, uh, there's a stone inside of the dream, and it comes flying in, and at some point in time, it actually wipes out the statue. But something about this, this vision terrified Nebuchadnezzar. And, and, and I think that as I'm studying this, that was the one thing I just, I couldn't get my head around was a statue being destroyed and, and the world changing, like, like, like something he was seeing in there, probably that, that we're not given in the discussion, added to the angst of this. And Daniel, in what he's writing, he's writing in the perspective of what will add value to the reader 
And so he says that a stone comes and smashes uh, this thing, and that uh, stone is going to be the Messiah, and we'll get to this in some of these other parts, but the stone that comes flying through and destroys it, it says that when it does, the whole earth is covered with this mountain, right? And the mountain is an eternal kingdom, a kingdom that has no end. And so that eternal kingdom, that kingdom with no end is that that Jesus establishes. Now, because he gets this right, Daniel is appointed head of the Magi. And, and I'm going to kind of jump off onto a little rabbit trail for a moment, and I hope that this will make sense and add value in just a moment. Um, uh, uh, Herodotus, the father of history, uh, said that the Magoi uh, were but charlatans under Babylonian rule, but somehow developed into incredibly insightful and revered religious leaders by the time of the Persian rule. And, and, and the reason I point this out is that this historian writes that evidence of the magi, as we understand them, the wise men, that, that when we look at the way that they were written of and talked about under Babylonian rule was as if they were just charlatans, but something happened that by the time the Persians take over, that these, uh, these magi are, are, are revered and they're on point right? The things that they're saying are beginning to shape kingdoms. Now, I want to jump forward to Matthew chapter 2 and verse 1. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem. And I don't know why this slide got all discombobulated here, but uh, in, inside of that verse, it says that uh, it uses this word for magi, which is magoi, okay? And, but when, when, when we look at it in the Greek, but when we look at it in the English, right, we translate it as wise men, right? So as, as this stuff is being written and put out there, you have the magoi who come from the east, okay? So they come from the east, which is the direction of Babylon, the, the empires of the Gentiles, the Persians, the, the, the Grecian Empire. So you have these Magoi who are coming. Why are they coming? They are coming because they saw the star. Why, 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 how did they know what the star was? How did they know that the star of Bethlehem was a, a sign? And, 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 and I want you to get this if you can, for just a moment, how did they know that there was a sign that would mark the Messiah? And why did they show up? Somebody had instructed them who had understanding of what to look for inside of prophetic Old Testament scripture so that they would know when the sign came that the Messiah came so that they could respond. Now, who was the head of the Magi that could have done this? Daniel. This is speculation that this is the, the, the fruit of Daniel's efforts. But what we know is that Daniel was in this area of exile for 70 plus years. And he had not just a little influence, but he had tremendous influence. He is put in charge of all of the wise men. He is given charge over them. And history, the accounts that we have, they show this consistent pattern of change, of evolution, if you will, from being just kind of like charlatans, soothsayers, just saying whatever is needed to keep their place, to actually adding insight to the kings that rule over these areas. And what we know is that the order of the Magoi, the Magi, continues up until the time of Christ. So you're, you're talking here about 600 years of consistent training and teaching that brought this group in. So Daniel comes in, and he is the one, I believe, that does this training, but we know that he's put over them. And they came saying, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. 
They see this thing and they know that this is the sign of the Messiah. So why the rabbit trail here, right? Because you might go, okay, we're talking about Daniel, we're jumping off. And so I want to do a better job at explaining why some of my tangents. Daniel was training people to look for the Messiah with precision. And we'll, I'm going to explain this in a moment, but you're going to see this word understanding come up over and over and over in the remainder of Daniel. Daniel is going to the Lord because he wants to understand. He is not resolved to going, look, this stuff's complicated and I'm not going to know, so I'll just kind of go along for the ride. Now, I, I know maybe that feels a little bit charged because you're sitting here going, oh, that's exactly my view on these things. What does it matter? What it'll be will be. I have no control over it. And, you know, I'm just, I love Jesus and that's enough. Daniel, on the other hand, doesn't believe that it's enough. Daniel believes that he should seek for understanding. And he not only believes it for himself, but he believes it for those who he is responsible for, and a new order is formed of people who believe that they need to be looking for the signs, because the signs are the thing that mark the points in history that will affirm our faith. Now, what does he see? In essence here, he is going to see six empires, okay? And uh, initially you might think, well, there's, there's only four or five parts here, but let's just break this down. Uh, from uh, 605 to 509, we're going to have the Babylonian empire, okay? And then uh, immediately following that, uh, and so this is the head of gold. Immediately following that, we're going to have the Medo-Persian Empire. Uh, that's going to last till 449, roughly. Uh, it's important to note that the, the, this torso with the two arms, the arms are given as imagery that this is an empire that is comprised of really two kingdoms. And so it was not a mistake that this language was used. Uh, and then we're going to have the, the, the middle, the bronze, and this is going to be the Grecian Empire, 449 to 27, right? And so this is going to last right up until just before the time of the Messiah. And then we're going to have the, the, the Empire of Rome, and that will be the one that will welcome the Messiah into the world. And so the Messiah comes on the scene uh, right here at the beginning of this process of this kingdom. And then we have this kind of bleeding into the feet, right? This next kingdom. Uh, and this next kingdom here, and the reason I say this bleeding in is because the, these are distinct metals, right? So the most valuable but weakest is at the top. And as you go down, they become worth less and less in value, but they become stronger and stronger, but they're shifting. There's something unique. There's a, there's a transformation that takes place. But then when you come to this final empire, right, there is something about it that is longer lasting, and it's as if the iron makes its way into the next and final empire, and that one is the one that is in existence at the point that Jesus comes and establishes uh, the eternal uh, uh, empire, the final empire. Uh, forever kingdom that you and I get to be a part of. And so uh, most uh, scholars consider this time period between when the stone in the dream shows up, and that's Jesus establishing the final and eternal kingdom, right? They consider this to be the church age that sets in between. So in Daniel chapter 7, so we get through the rest of these chapters, and these are, uh, the, the next few chapters are about specific moments of tribulation that people are walking through, and what they're meant to do for us is to give us hope that, that in the midst of some of the fiery moments that will show up, God will be with us. 
So in the Babylonian Empire, underneath Nebuchadnezzar, a ruthless king, he's the one that is bringing down the hammer. He's the one that's calling for the execution of people. God wants you and I to know that if during the head of gold, those who are faithful and serve him are going to be protected and taken care of, then as we make our way through these kingdoms, right, and these empires and new generations come, that the same will be said for those who are going to serve him, for those who are going to love him, those who are going to be in pursuit of him. So if you and I will live our lives in such a way as to honor God, then in the moments of difficulty, God will be with us. And really, isn't that really the hope that you really want to have as a Christian? Isn't that what you want when you show up here? Is you want to believe that your relationship with God matters in such a way that he is with you in the difficult moment, that he is with you when you're walking through the difficult season? So then we come to Daniel chapter 7, and there's a shift in the writing. And we move from these stories into Daniel's own dreams and Daniel's specific prophecy as given to him uh, from God. And so he's going to begin with having the same vision, right, the same results, but different imagery. So he has a dream, and instead of dreaming of the statue, he is actually going to have a dream, and there will be four beasts that rise from the seas, okay? And, and, and this, these, these four beasts, and I'm going to lay these up here for us real quick. The first is the, the lion, and the lion is a beast that has the wings of eagles, okay? And this one is representative of Babylon, and then the next will be the bear, and the bear uh, is... Uh, interesting things about it, and we'll talk more about it in a moment, but he has ribs in his mouth as if he is, the, it says that he is the one that devours flesh, uh, and he is tilted on his side. That is symbolic of the fact that this is an imbalanced uh, empire, right? It kind of has two rulers, two kingdoms that are, are making it up, but some really interesting things about the Persians. The Persians were the ones that are accredited with this the invention of what would ultimately become crucifixion. They were famous for taking and spearing people and then leaving them on the spear and lifting and setting the spear into the ground or spearing them to a tree and, and leaving you there to just bleed out and die and then saying, see you later. This picture of what? A devourer of flesh. They didn't see value in the actual life and humanity of people that were not like them. And then we have the leopard. We'll get to the leopard in a moment, but uh, this is uh, the, the, the empire of Greece. And then there is an animal, a beast that comes up that, that Daniel is not able to give an, 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 an attribution to uh, it as far as being like an animal that we have seen before. And on midweek, I'll talk a little bit about how these images show back up in John's writings in the book of Revelation. But there is a fourth beast, and this beast is not like an animal that Daniel has seen, or at least he does not communicate it to us in such a way that we would understand that. So think about these two visions for a moment, right? The first was the statue, and this is from a king's perspective. So how does a king see the, 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 the movement of God's work in the future? He sees it as this statue, this, this piece of, uh, of idolatry, because how, did, how do kings act? Kings tend to act very selfish, self-absorbed, and what we will see through history is that they, it is not uncommon for them to even reference themselves as gods. In fact, listen, as terrified as Nebuchadnezzar was, what's the, the next thing we see in Daniel chapter 3 is he says, well, if I'm the head of gold, then I'm going to make a statue 90 feet tall made out of gold, and if I'm going to be the head of gold, I'm going to own being the head of gold, and everyone's going to bow down and worship, right? 
Why are they going to worship at the idol? They're going to worship at the idol because I don't want to stand there all the time because I've got other godly things to be doing. But by them bowing down to that idol, it will be a, a way for me to know that they are in submission. And so this is the view that a king has. And God says that even in the midst of how you view yourself, you need to understand that it is but a stone that will come and wipe it all out. And then you have these beasts, and these come from the, the, the man's perspective. Daniel is, is, is just a man, and he doesn't see it this way. He sees each of these empires as terrifying. He sees each of them as demonstrative and destroying, not as royalty that rules. And so, to me, this is a slightly more terrifying dream to be sitting there and in a place of sleep and out of the sea comes a lion with the wings of, uh, of an eagle, the bear with the ribs in its mouth tilted on one side, right? And, and you've got to imagine that if it's got ribs in its mouth, it's probably got blood pouring from its face. It says that he is the devourer of flesh, and then there's a leopard with four wings and four heads. Like, this is just not the normal stuff that I see when I'm walking around, okay? I, I, I serve Nebuchadnezzar. I'm sure he's got his own little zoo going on, right? With little exotic animals from everywhere. That's how I'm familiar with these things. But I have not yet seen a four-headed, four-winged leopard. And then comes this, this final beast in, in this imagery with iron teeth and ten horns. Uh, this thing's a monster, right? It's not even an animal. It's a monster. It's something that God in the garden did not even create for Adam to call by name. And so Daniel is seeing these things that are beyond his worldly understanding. And then when he comes out of this dream, right, what we discover is that these beasts are four kingdoms, just as with the statue, that will be led by Gentiles and have dominion over the earth. Now, when we talk about prophecy, one of the first things that people will say is, okay, well, the thing about prophecy is, Pastor Jim, that you're just doing the best you can do to interpret it, right? And so I, I appreciate the fact that you think that these are four kingdoms. In this case, I don't have to do that because the reason that we know that these are kingdoms is because in Daniel chapter 7, verse 17, it tells us, these four great beasts are four kings who shall rise out of the earth. In fact, the angel of the Lord is going to come in a moment and actually talk in detail about the kingdoms. Why? Because Daniel wants understanding, so God's going to bring understanding. You'll see this in a moment. Now, chapter 7, verse 18, But the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, forever, and ever. Right? This is the good news of this. Daniel says, scary, terrifying, monstrous, devourers of flesh. But in the end, a kingdom is established and the children of God, the saints of the Most High, rule forever and ever and ever and ever. That is one, two, three, four four, five, and then a sixth empire, a final empire. What is that empire? It is the empire that God comes, that Jesus establishes, and you and I, if we are children of God, our names found in the Lamb's Book of Life, that, that we forever are a part of. And this is why the language within the Christian church is this idea of eternity. Born again for what? Forever for an eternal life, not just a life where we're sitting, and I make this joke all the time, but just sitting on a cloud in our diaper with a harp playing music. That's not what's going down. There is purpose. I don't know what all the purpose is. At the end of the day, God has something that you and I get to be a part of. Now, for the remainder of chapter 8, he's going to talk about the fourth beast, this one right here, and its role in a coming kingdom. And then we're going to jump two years into the future. 
So the scripture says that Daniel hears all of this. He hears some detail on the fourth beast, which I'll cover more of that on midweek. He hears more of this, and it says that, that it made him sick, right? The, this was not like, oh, wow, this was, you know, season four of Stranger Things. Let's do this, you know? This was the type of stuff that he was receiving that was not only terrifying, but because he knew that this was prophecy, it was applicable. That, that now on top of all of that, it is also something that he knows to be worried about. And two years passed by. Two years. And, and I think this is good for us to understand when we're looking at timeline, when we're talking about history. A lot of times we just think all this stuff is happening at one specific moment. Th these things are happening after Nebuchadnezzar has died, chapter 7. Uh, Belshazzar is now ruling in the first year, and two years later we're in, in the third year of Belshazzar's rule. So Daniel is 80 plus years old at this point. Like, he's not a, he's not a young guy when he's, when he's seeing these things. And so... Uh, he begins in chapter 8, and he has a dream, and in this dream, he sees a ram with two horns. He sees a ram with two horns. This will be the uh, Media and Persian Empire. Uh, and a lot of times you'll see it written uh, Medo-Persian, uh, so M-E-D-O. Uh, and then sometimes you'll see it as Media and uh, Persia. And I thought this was just a little interesting fact. The word Media, when we go back, it actually means the middle. And so the reason that we call things like movies, TV shows, the news, newspapers, Media, is because in communication, they represent the middle of communication. There's the source, there's the recipient, and then all of that content is the middle of the process of communication. And so that's why we use the word media because it's what's in the middle. It's what's between the creator and the person that's receiving it. And why is that? Well, this, this empire, this portion, this Medo, the media people were in the middle of the territory when the kingdom began. And so they were known as the, the people in the middle. And then you have the Persians, which we're much more familiar with. And then you have a, a goat with a great horn. And so uh, the, the, uh, the goat here shows up. And I'm going to get to exactly what uh, these were in just one moment. Let's see if I can get that to stick. I think I can. There we go. All right. So the goat with a great horn. Now, we'll, we'll, we'll take a look at some of these for just a moment doing some historical research. So in 340 B.C., all right, so you have the Medo-Persian Empire that comes in. Daniel is alive during this time, okay? So he transitions from the Babylonian Empire into the, uh, the Empire of Media and Persia. And so he's actually walking some of this out before he dies. What's interesting is that you could make the argument, well, what, what he wrote, because he lived into here, he you know, maybe this was not prophecy. Maybe it was just history. Uh, what I want to do is I want to look at the writings that move past him and look at some of what happens in history uh, so that, that helps to line up with why we see this as prophecy, okay? So 340 BC, Philip II breaks up an alliance of Greek states. So you've got this man, he's the king of Macedonia, and you have a series of Greek states that have come together, and they have created an alliance. They're not a kingdom per se. They are just a network of, uh, of tribes and communities that have said, we're there for each other. We uh, will fight together when need be, uh, uh, but, but we're not seceding and giving throne uh, uh, or, or a rule to any particular person. So there's not going to be a throne here. But, but Philip II comes in and he breaks up that alliance, okay? Now, he has a son, and his son 
who, who was taught by Aristotle led a victory over the sacred band of Thebes. And this just gives you some more historical context. Context: Aristotle is alive, and uh, Philip II's son is being trained. So he's receiving, uh, at the time, what is seen as kind of the, the pinnacle of philosophy and science and introductions to math. So he's getting training from what historians today would argue is probably one of the sharpest minds of the day, okay? And then he gets old enough and he goes into battle with his dad. And, and this is just kind of notable that he comes in and he has victory over this group that's called the Sacred Band of Thebes. Now, who was the Sacred Band of Thebes? Well, the Sacred Band of Thebes is a group of 300 soldiers that were uh, given uh, credit for actually defeating and dismantling a group called the Spartans. Right, and we're familiar with the Spartans, uh, not just from history, but even in our uh, 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 culture today. We have Spartans that are represented in video games like Halo or in movies like 300. Right, and 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 those, uh, of course, the 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 ones that we have in, in a video game. Those are things that are just pull, drawing on a name from history. The movie 300 is just this really hyper embellished account of how the Spartans. Uh, uh, lived their lives and acted. But history tells us that this group of 300 soldiers actually were able to wipe out, dismantle the Spartans, and uh, Philip II's son is able to destroy them. And it's such a powerful moment that, that history books say that, that when it happened, everybody understood what had happened. Like, these were the elite soldiers, and here comes a young man who puts together his first kind of army, and he defeats these guys. And it's so powerful that, that they say that Philip II, looking on the battlefield where the sacred band of Thebes' bodies laid, that he saw it and wept. Because these were, in his mind, some of the heroes of war. Now, what was interesting, because I personally go down the rabbit trails when I'm looking at Scripture, right? Like, I'm reading, I'm like, oh, I want to know more about the sacred band of Thebes. Would you want to know more about the sacred band of Thebes? So, I, uh, uh, I have subscriptions to a couple of uh, academic uh, encyclopedias and things beyond Wikipedia. Let me just say it that way, because Wikipedia is the people's encyclopedia. And guess what? You qualify, if you breathe, to add attribution to the encyclopedia. And so you can go in there and make sure that history says what you want it to. Now, supposedly there are other people making sure that it's true, but I found something really interesting because, and I, it kind of took me off guard, and it, uh, both Wikipedia and then Encyclopedia Britannica cite that the Sacred Band of Thebes were comprised of 150 male couples. So it's 300 men, and it was 150 married couples that went into battle. And I thought, I, I would think that this would have been something that, you know, would have been talked about a lot more. And, and uh, so it took me further down the rabbit hole. And what I discovered is that the only source uh, for this concept that is cited as historical fact was actually found in a book written 400 years later called Parallel Lives by a Greek historian named Plutarch who was admittedly uh, a lover of satire and as he wrote history, he loved to embellish it uh, just to kind of get a rise out of people. And, and he admits this. And, and, and why, why does this matter? This is, this is, this is why this is why the rabbit trail for you right here again, okay? Why this rabbit trail? Because it illustrates bias in standards. Because you have something that is written 400 plus years later by a man who acknowledges that he loves satire and he loves to embellish stories because he loves to get a rise out of people. 400 years later, and scholars will accept it as fact why you assume what the narrative is, but it illustrates a bias in standards. So when we are talking about the Word of God and the same standards cannot be applied, I think that's a problem for us. When we are talking about 
the authenticity of Scripture being challenged over and over and over. Well, the standard by which they challenge the authenticity of Scripture, they do not use when they are challenging other aspects of history. And then the second is that it reiterates the need for you and I to search. You and I, just, just because, listen, if you hear or read a version of history that seems odd, out of place, or different from what you've learned, then follow your instincts and do the research right? You have more access to information than any generation in the history of the world. So if it sounds like maybe it's different than what you've been taught, or it sounds out of place, then do the work, right? Do the work, dive in, find the answers so that you know the truth, because a clear picture of history will greatly impact and shape the way that we manage our lives in the future. So at the end of the day, was it true? I have no idea. And I'm not in here to try to debate with you and argue with you around the principles of these 300 soldiers. What I want to tell you is that if we're going to look at things like the Word of God and create standards for how we validate and understand them, right, then we should be able to do the same thing with any information that is brought to us. And if we create those standards and we use those standards, this is what happens is that when people present other doctrine and other views of faith or universalism, we'll be able to use those standards to abolish those ideas. And so the year is 339 B.C., Philip II has found victory, and he is rejoicing in 337 B.C. Uh, uh, well, in 339 B.C., he divorces his wife, Olympias, and remarries. And at the celebration, uh, Olympias, his wife, is there, or his ex-wife, is there, and so is his son that helped him in victory. And him and his son get into an argument, like I would think as you would, if this was your mom and your dad was acting this way. And so uh, the son and the mom, they flee into exile. Dad and son reconcile in 337. And then in 336, Philip II dies. And his son, who we know is Alexander the Great, becomes the ruler, the first king of this empire. Why would we say that he's the first king? Because Philip II was just content with managing Macedonia and being in charge of what he had. Alec Alexander the Great had an ambition to rule the world. He wanted to go to the ends of the earth and be in control. And so as a young man, he moves with a swiftness and with a fury, and it is on, and he is successful. Look here in Daniel 8, 21, and the, and, and the goat is the king of Greece, and the great horn between his eyes is the first king. And so scholars say that this is Alexander the Great. As for the horn that was broken, in place of which four others arose, four kingdoms shall arise from his nation, but not with his power. So what did Daniel do? Daniel came, and he conquered all of these nations, all of these people groups, and then he ends up in Babylon in uh, 323 uh, BC. And what he wants to do is he wants to create a super race. He has a vision of merging together certain races to create this elite race. And then he goes in the midst of this kind of amb ambitious idea on this uh, drunken binge for 10 days and probably got some type of alcohol poisoning because he is on his deathbed and they ask him, you know, Alexander, you're dying. You're a young man and you've done all of this. Well, who do we give the kingdom to? Because you have no heir. And, and, and the words that he says on his deathbed is give it to the strongest. And they interpret this to mean that the strongest of his generals, and so the four strongest generals that he had, Cassander, Ptolemy, Antigonus, and Seleucus, uh, become the rulers of a divided empire, right? Exactly as the prophecy said uh, when we were looking at it, right? So you have what? You have the leopard, and the leopard has four heads because when, the le the, when, when, when Alexander the Great died, four kings take over, and they are Pergamum, Egypt, Macedonia, and Syria. Chapter 8, verse 23, And at the latter end of their kingdom, when the transgressors have reached their limit, a king of bold face, one who understands riddles, shall arise. 
His power shall be great, but not by his own power, and he shall cause fearful destruction and shall succeed in what he does and destroy mighty men and the people who are the saints. By his cunning, this is a good word for us to hold on to, he shall make deceit prosper under his hand, and in his own mind he shall become great. Without warning he shall destroy many, and he shall even rise up against the prince of princes, and he shall be broken, but by no human hand. The vision of the evenings and the mornings that has been told is true, but seal up the vision, for it refers to many days from now. So what does he say? He says that there is a king that is coming that is Daniel you can seal this up what does that mean it doesn't mean keep it hidden don't like go bury it in a time capsule and tell the people to dig it up what that means is that means just hey look you can put a seal on it because it is for later generation and so Alexander the Great dies we have four generals that come into power and then uh, the, the one specific group the group uh, 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 the, the, the kingdom that is what we call Syria. The fourth king of Syria uh, in 170 BC is known as uh, uh, Antiochus IV or Antiochus Epiphanes. Okay, and I said, you know, that word cunning, he was a problem solver, right? He was smart, and, and we think about like, ah, I just had an epiphany, right? Ah, I just had this, this wisdom, this moment of insight, right? So there's this correlation that's happening. He, he comes to Jerusalem, and he kills 80,000, enslaves 40,000. He dedicates the temple to Zeus and places a statue of Zeus in the temple, sacrifices a pig in the temple as well. And what do the children of Israel call this? They call this the abomination of desolation. And so there is a king that will come and he will continue the oppression that Israel will walk in and, and Daniel seeing these things and then they are coming to pass. Now, rem, I'll, I'll remind you that this was uh, in uh, 170 BC. So we are roughly 170 years before the birth of Christ and we have the abomination of desolation. Now this is where I'm gonna end today. Daniel chapter nine. And, and most scholars consider this to be the backbone of biblical prophecy. So if you're looking at prophecy anywhere in scripture, then most of the time, our standards for which we, we try to gain understanding and interpretation, they derive from Daniel chapter 9, okay? So uh, most of what we're going to pull from biblical prophecy comes, comes from this as a standard. So Daniel chapter 9, verse 1, to give us some time perspective again, in the first year of Darius, the son of uh, Assurus, by descent of Mede, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans. So time frame where again, he's in his 80s, okay? Uh, maybe even 90 years old at this point. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, perceived in the books the number of years that according to the word of the Lord to Jeremiah the prophet must pass before the end of the desolations of Jerusalem, namely 70 years. And so uh, uh, Daniel, is reading at this point the prophecy of Jeremiah. This is all tying together. Follow with me right here. Daniel, in his downtime, is reading through the, 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 the writings of Jeremiah. And if you'll remember, I said Jeremiah was alive doing prophetic work at the time that Daniel goes into exile. He dies during Daniel's life, and the the the, the, the word that was written has made its way to Daniel. Daniel is reading these, these prophecies. And this is what you see. You see that in the midst of prophecy, we have a prophet responding to prophecy. And this just, I think, can add a little bit of value to why it is important for us to talk about these things. Right? You might go, well, how is this applicable, right? Tomorrow I've got to take a test. I need how to have a good attitude when I'm taking a test. I, I, I understand those things, and we, we jump in and out of that. Daniel felt that it was valuable for him to be reading the prophet Jeremiah, even in the midst of God using him as a prophet. Why is that? Daniel has this desire, and it's a desire that you and I should have, and that is the need to understand why. 
And so Daniel in chapter 9, he's sitting here and he's looking at this and he's like, okay, Jeremiah, you're telling us 70 years. And so, Lord, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at this 70-year period. Daniel chapter 9, verse 20, he took into exile in Babylon those who had escaped from the sword and they became servants to him and to his sons until the establishment of the kingdom of Persia to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah until the land had enjoyed its Sabbaths all the days that it lay desolate. Uh, and this is actually not in Daniel 9. This is in Jeremiah 31. I didn't put the tag in there properly. Uh, Jeremiah says that the reason that it was 70 years is because there, were set, there was 490 years where the children of Israel had not given the land rest. So on the seventh year of every seven-year cycle, the land was supposed to be given rest. But Israel just did what they wanted. They looked at the teachings and they took the parts that they liked and they didn't take the parts that they didn't like. This is relevant to us, right? Do we, do we not kind of always in culture constantly have the debate and the argument for how we interpret scripture and then how we should express and live our lives, right? Is there a call for me to be pure in this area or have integrity in that area? And is there not somebody else who's saying, well, that doesn't really matter here, right? And, and that's the same approach that Israel's facing. And so they're not doing the things that God has asked them to do. And God says, listen, if you won't give the land the rest, I'm going to give the land rest. And that's where we get the 70 years. And Jeremiah is realizing, I mean, Jeremiah is saying this and Daniel is realizing this. And so what does Daniel do? Daniel prays for mercy because he understands what got them to captivity. And this is the first half of chapter 9. He is, he is praying for mercy. Now, I want to just point out that there, there is this idea of confession versus repentance, okay? Uh, when we are uh, talking about repentance, this is when we go to the Lord and we say, God, for, forgive me for what I've done. And, and actually here in Jeremiah 31, verse 29, it says, in those days they shall no longer say the fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. So look at what, it's, what he says. He says that, that you, you'll no longer say that, well, my dad ate sour grapes, and so my teeth are set on edge. He says here in verse 30, but everyone shall die for his own iniquity. Each man who eats sour grapes, his teeth shall be set on edge. And so there's a, there's a distinction for what's happening here in Daniel 9. We're coming to the end of a 70-year period. Daniel's seeking to understand God's giving us all of this information because he wants us to have a desire to understand. And what Daniel is seeing is Daniel is reading this book, that, right, that this, the, these writings of Jeremiah, and this is inside of what he's reading that Jeremiah is saying that it is, it is, it is not for us to repent for the sins of those that have come before us, right? But it is okay for us to have an acknowledgement and then we can repent for ourselves. So why is it at the end of 70 years that in the, in, with Daniel that the children of Israel don't all come home? Because they continue to live in sin. And so over the course of the next 490 years, they're going to come home in little pockets at a time. Why? Because the children of Israel, the, the, the ones that are God's children, they continue to live in sin. They continue to do what they have been instructed not to do. So what is Daniel praying? Listen to this. Daniel 9, verse 18. Oh my God, incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes and see our desolations and the city that is called by your name. For we do not present our pleas before you because of our righteousness. So he's talking about himself. He says, I'm not coming to you because of my righteousness, but because of your great mercy. So God, I am not here to tell you that we've got this stuff all figured out. I'm asking you to have mercy. Oh Lord, hear. Oh Lord, forgive. Oh Lord, pay attention and act. Delay not for your own sake. Oh my God, because your city and your people are called by your name. He is worried about what is happening to his people, to his homeland. He acknowledges that they have been a sinful people, and he is coming and saying, God, we are still a sinful people, and I need you to forgive my role in it. I need you to, me and my brothers, the, we are here, right? And we are saying, forgive us. And there is a distinction here, because I, I hear it taught sometimes that this was him coming and praying a prayer of repentance for generations past, right? But just within the context of what we have here with him talking about Jeremiah, 
Jeremiah says that, that, is, that we are not held to the iniquities of the past, right? Our, it's our iniquities that shape and define us. And so who we are today is what defines who we are in God's eyes. Now, it is a prayer for mercy. And I think it is a prayer that any time that we are walking through trials and tribulations, whether they are brought on by bad decisions or just prophetic movement, that it is appropriate for us to pray for mercy. Now, when we see God's prophetic word at work, what is our response? How do we respond when we see God at work? And so wrapping up Daniel 9 right here, 23, at the beginning of your pleas for mercy, a word went out and I have come to tell it to you, for you are greatly loved. Therefore, consider the word and understand the vision. So this whole time, if, I, if I'm going to sum this up for you right here, right? This whole time, I've been telling you, God's revealing crazy things. And instead of going, uh, I'll just set that to the side, Daniel keeps going, God, help me understand. So are we living in the last days? Are the things that we're seeing right here, right now in front of us, are these the signs of the times? Are we in the, the biblical return of Christ, right? Because I think that's a question that if you're a Christian, you're probably curious. Like, like, is this it? Is it happening? And so when you're in the midst of that, instead of throwing your hands up and going, whatever will be, will be, imagine what would happen if you began to seek the Lord and pray, right? and ask the Lord to reveal these things. And so Daniel here, he's praying for mercy because he sees that this is a difficult season and the angel of the Lord shows up and says, you're loved. And he says what? He says, therefore consider the word and understand the vision. And so the, the angel says, I'm, we're gonna help you understand. So why give us prophecy if we could not understand it? Look at Matthew 13, verse 11. Jesus answered, you have been chosen to know the secrets about the kingdom of heaven. So he's, he's speaking to a crowd, but others cannot know these secrets. So what's the distinguishing point? What's the difference between those that are sitting there and those that are not sitting there? The difference is that those that are sitting there were seeking answers. He's, he's, he's doing parables. He's doing teaching. And they want to know the answer to some of this stuff. So they're showing up and trying to dig in. And so what does he say? He says, you have been chosen to know the secrets about the kingdom of heaven, but others cannot know these secrets. You can't know the secret unless you hear the secret. Those who have understanding will be given more, and they will have all they need. But those who do not have understanding, even what they have will be taken away from them. And so those that do not pursue the understanding, those that do not try to dig in, they're going to get further and further away from understanding these things. This is why I use stories to teach the people. They see, but they don't really see. They hear, but they don't really hear or understand. And so what is it? It's a combination of hearing the story and living in the world that you're living in so that when those things that he mentioned in the story, you go, hold on. That's what's happening right now, right? So, so the, 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 there's a parallel between being in the world and being in the Word. So they show that the things Isaiah said about them are true. You will listen and listen, but you will not understand. You will look and look, but you will not learn. For the minds of these people have become stubborn. They do not hear with their ears, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might really understand what they see with their eyes and hear with their ears. They might really understand in their minds and come back to me and be healed. Let me say, don't be the stubborn, right? Now, I, I, listen, here's what I'm not saying. I'm not saying that because I get up here and teach something that that's your understanding. Because that's not what my invitation for you today is. My invitation to you is not listen to what Pastor Jim's saying and go home and take it as fact. I'm not saying that to you. What I'm saying is get into a position of prayer in your life. If you want to understand why the world is in the state that it's in, go and ask the Lord, why are we in the state that we're in? Don't get sucked up into all of the distractions. Ask the Lord for understanding and the Lord will bring understanding. But you've got to hear the voice of the Lord to be able to get that part of it so that when it's happening and the, and the word of the Lord says this, and then all of a sudden you walk out the door and it's exactly like what you heard, you'll begin to go, oh man, this, this is making sense. Like I'm beginning to understand. 
Daniel 9, 24, and it gets even crazier. And this is why I have to go into these into an additional uh, midweek on this, is that 70 weeks are decreed about your people and your holy city. 70 weeks. The 70 weeks is not 70 weeks, but the word week uh, uh, is interchangeable in the Hebrew language for the word year, and it is clear clear in the language that what he's talking about is 70 groups of seven. So 490 years, that's how long it took to get to this time of captivity. And there are 490 more years in front of you and and seasons that are coming. And so the Lord desires that we desire to understand. He wants us to want this. He wants you to to, to have a desire to understand what his word means, not just so that you can feel good about yourself tomorrow, but so that you can be a part of changing the kingdom of heaven, advancing the kingdom of heaven. Luke 19, Jesus says to them, and I don't have time to get into this, and I knew I didn't, so I didn't put all the verses, but he tells them, he tells this group of of people as he's coming into Jerusalem and he's weeping, and he says that, that had you paid attention you would have known that today was coming and then you would have experienced peace. But because you did not pay attention, you will not be in a safe place. You will not escape that which is coming. I mean, there's so much, man. I could just go for another hour. Like, like Isaac Newton talks about this, right? The, the father of modern science and calculus. And, and, and uh, we have a, a guy who was uh, the overseer for uh, criminal, and, criminal studies in Scotland Yard in the 1800s who was a mathematician, and he was able to trace back Daniel's prophecy, and he was able to put the, the, the specific date in place, I think it was April the 6th, 29 AD, as being the day that Jesus comes into Jerusalem and says this. And that's really odd because that is the 10th of Nisan, on the Hebrew calendar, which is in their season of festivals, feasts, it's the day they went and picked the spotless lamb that would be sacrificed. Like to the day the lamb walks into the city and reveals himself on a donkey. And up until that time, every time he did something, what did he say? He said, hey, listen, don't tell anybody about this. Let's keep it between you and I. Why? Because he knew he had to come in. And he said, man, if you had been paying attention, I mean, like if, if people who are smarter than me can put these dates in place to the moment, to the day, I would think to myself, man, I, maybe, maybe I should be reading Scripture and prophecy and trying to understand because maybe it applies to me. And what does it all come down to? From the bottle to the table. Listen, I've got four kids. I've got four of them. My, my oldest is uh, going to college this year. My, my youngest is eight. He's video games and tackle hugs. You would have no respect for me if I had an 18-year-old sitting in here drinking from a bottle. You would have no respect for me if I had an eight-year-old in here drinking from a bottle. I know there are a handful of people out there who are very progressive in their parenting skills and they think that's really hip and cool. I'm just saying, I understand that my, my responsibility as a parent is to move my children from the bottle to the table. Paul says, can we move from milk to meat? So. If you're not a believer, you're watching this online, you're sitting in the room, or you're a new Christian, you're going, you're probably overwhelmed. You're thinking, man, this is a lot. And if you are a, a mature believer, right, you, you might still think this is a lot. You might think, man, this is, this is an hour's worth of information. And, and I get it, and, and, and it's gut-wrenching for me to think that, uh, uh, that the, our attention spans are what they are, and I'm trying to cover material that is really tough to fit into a 25-minute moment. It's tough. I, I, I want you, though, I want you to have a, a desire to go to the places that are at the table where the meat is at. And we're going to get into some of this stuff on midweek where it is definitely, there, we, the further we go into prophecy, the more divided scholars become. 
right? Some of them will believe that there's a rapture. Some don't believe in a rapture. Some believe that the church is raptured out before a tribulation. Some believe the tribulation isn't even going to happen. Some believe that we're already in the millennial reign, and some believe that that is yet to come. And I have a belief system, and I'm going to share it on midweek. So if you want to know what I believe, you'll have to come there. So I'll end with this. I know I keep saying in closing, it's terrible. Like I watch pastors do that all the time. I'm like, I'm not going to do that. Luke 21. Now, when these things begin to take place, straighten up and raise your heads because your redemption is drawing near. Why would Jesus say that? If it wasn't important for us to have some picture, some understanding. So for those who have understanding, there might be a time in your life in which it's a season to straighten up. So prophecy fulfilled reminds my soul of who God is. And prophecy to be fulfilled compels my soul to know who God is. It's the prophetic nature. And so the quest is not the results of understanding, but the fruit of the pursuit of understanding. You don't have to get the answers, but can I tell you that in the midst of trying, God will show up and you might not ever have them all, and you might not have total clarity. That's not what the quest is. That's not what we're trying to get. What we're trying to do is we're trying to gain enough understanding to where we are connected with the heartbeat of God. Stand to our feet as we close. Next week, my good friend Isaac Armstrong, missionary from Mexico, is going to be here. I promise he will not preach as long, and then we'll jump into a new series, and I won't preach as long. I want you, I want us, right? I want you, I want you to want to know the things of God. I want you to know not just the wide birth of who God is, but the depth of who he is. Now, if you're in here today or if you're watching online and you do not know Jesus as Lord of your life, can I tell you, there is so much historical, archaeological, astronomical evidence for the Creator. And there are standards by which we authenticate and validate the Word of God. And if any of that evidence is is bearing witness to you today, and you're thinking, maybe I need Jesus to be Lord of my life, can I tell you that it's really not the evidence that's doing it, and it's not what I'm saying. It's the Holy Spirit that is at work inside right now trying to, to urge you to that place. That's the, it's the work of the Holy Spirit that leads us to, to Jesus. And, and, and it's the work of the cross that takes us to salvation. And so if that's happening inside of you, the invitation is to come to know Christ and then to begin a journey of really knowing him and preparing your life for his return. And so if that's you, I want to pray with you. If we would right now, if you're online, just pause what you're doing for a moment and just in reverence, bow your head and pray for those that might be responding. If you're in the room here today, just bow your heads and close your eyes. Listen, if you want to know Jesus as sort of your life, it's not a really complicated thing. Scripture says if we believe in our heart and confess with our mouths that Jesus is Lord, we will be saved. Salvation is a gift that's freely extended to us. It's not something that we have to do a a song and dance for. No, he comes, he's paid the price, and he extends it to you. And, And so we literally just come to a place where we acknowledge, I can't do this on my own, and I need a Savior. I need understanding. The world around me is falling apart, and I don't want to miss God. And if that's you, I want to pray with you right now with your heads bowed and your eyes closed and you want to make that decision. I just would ask you to pray a prayer like this. Jesus, I declare you king of my life. I declare that I need a savior and I declare that I believe that you are the only hope for my life. Reveal yourself to me as I surrender to you. Seek me. Sift me. Know me. And help me to be a better man or woman in pursuit of you. In your mighty name, amen. Before you leave, before you leave, purpose in your heart today. Do you want to know? And if you do, make an action plan and dive into his word and begin the process of research. Love you guys. We will see you next Sunday.